the main case for OER is around approved effectiveness of teaching and learning, students learning more. Um, a secondary case is increased flexibility for faculty. Um, and maybe the final case is in costs, uh, decreasing costs. So um, as a student, when, when you don't have access to the instructional materials that you need, when you don't have the book or you can't afford to purchase a subscription to the website or something like that, then you can't read the homework, you can't work the problems. Um, and it's very hard to be prepared if you can't read before class, and if you can't even do the homework, then it's impossible to pass your class. Uh, as a faculty member, you might have four or five or ten textbooks to choose from as you're getting ready to teach a class, but that's all the choice you have. You can only choose this book or that one. Uh, once you choose a book, because it's completely copyrighted, you have no control over the order that things are in there, or maybe there are examples that were written for this region, but you teach in this region, and you wish you could take some things out, and maybe, maybe take out photographs of the mountains and put in photographs of forests, and take out examples about this and put in other kinds of examples. You just don't have that possibility at all um, with closed material. And so as a faculty member, you're, uh, what you can ask students to read is really dictated to you by the publisher. Um, so to when you make a choice to use openly licensed materials, then you have permission to make changes. And, um, and it's really empowering for you as a faculty member to be, have more flexibility and be able to do exactly what you want instead of be able to do kind of what you want. Um, of course, if students have, are required to buy textbooks, they love getting free textbooks instead of having to pay a lot of money. Um, and then there's also an, an idea of continuous improvement of being able to teach a class and then go back and look at the data on the course and how students performed on the assessments and to, as a professional educator, reflect on what worked and what didn't work and think about what you want to improve next semester when you teach the course again or next year when you teach the course again. And as you find problems and things that need to be made better to just be able to open up the course and change it. Whereas if you adopt a commercial textbook and it turns out that the, there's some portion of the text that really isn't supporting student learning the way you want. Your only choice is to maybe assign a second textbook that does a better job. Now you have students buying two textbooks and only reading part of one or part of another. But you can't really engage in continuous improvement if somebody else owns the rights to the materials that you're teaching from. So you know, in summary, I think better learning outcomes for students, more flexibility for faculty, lower cost for students, and also being reprofessionalized as a faculty member in terms of engaging with a continuous improvement process on your teaching. I would guess that most of the people using OER are using it in their classroom. And that's just because, I mean, I don't, I don't know what the real number is, but I would guess maybe 90% of all classes that are taken are still taken online as opposed to being taken, fa or, or sorry, mm -hmm. are taken face to face. The, only a few courses are being taken online compared to the total number of courses students are taking in the higher education system. Um, so here, I would guess probably 90% of the presentations are about using o OER in your classroom, right. and a couple of them are about using yeah. OER online. I mean, I, I think about content as infrastructure. It's just you've got to have some content for students to watch or to read or to interact with so that you can get on with the business of doing your pedagogy and the activities you want them to engage in and the formative assessments and things. And um, Right now, for most schools, they're not capable of making a big transformation or doing something really innovative. Um, that the, the thing that they can do is they can take a normal textbook out and replace it with OER. And maybe the pedagogy stays exactly the same this year because we made this one change and that was the only change that we could make. Um, in online classes, sometimes the content is all built into the course, but a lot of online classes say week one, open your textbook and read chapter one. And so those online classes still have all the issues that you have with commercial and proprietary content uh, being expensive, being inflexible, be not being able to do improvement uh, activities on it. I, I don't know that I think OER um, directionally benefits face-to-face -face versus online more. Yeah, so um, we well, we've been doing, for the last three years, we've been doing a range of efficacy studies on what happens when a teacher stops assigning commercial textbooks and starts assigning OER instead of them. Not OER as a supplement to them, but in place of them. And what we've seen 
over and over and over again. And this last study we completed had 16,000 students across nine different uh, colleges across the United States. And uh, what we found in the analysis there was the students whose faculty members assigned OER instead of commercial textbooks had a higher completion rate, so fewer of them withdrew from the course. Uh, a larger percentage of them finished the course with a C or better grade. Um, those students enrolled in more classes during the semester when they were taking the course where they're using OER. And they enrolled in more classes in the next semester after they took OER. And we think you know, the explanatory mechanisms there for the first two are purely about access. So um, if I have access to all the materials that I need, um, I'm not, uh, of course I'm going to complete the course with a better grade because I'm reading the, I have the opportunity to read the homework to do the practice problems. In the U.S. context, um, students are often waiting for two or three weeks for their financial aid to uh, arrive from the government. And so they haven't been able to buy their, even though they want to buy the textbooks, they haven't been able to buy them for the first two or three weeks. And now they're behind and now they have to make a judgment call about whether um, there's a day by which if they drop the class before that day, they get their tuition money refunded. And there's also no penalty on their grade card. And so you're behind by two weeks. Now you're trying to decide you know, whether you're going to be able to catch up or not. And a lot of students just play it safe and drop out there. So now their graduation slows down. They have to wait a whole semester and sign up again. And the institution is giving back money to students that they had collected. So the institution is losing money. Um, and then in terms of how many courses they take, um, as a student, if I have a certain budget for how much I can afford to spend on school this year, and I save $200 or $400 on textbooks, I can reinvest that in order to take additional courses or to engage in some other kinds of educational experiences. And um, so that, that's a pure affordability issue, uh, which I, you know, I'm going to move faster and do better because I, can, because I can afford to. I mean, what you're just talking about with these uh, performance-based funding models. Um, if you're keeping students in your courses longer, if the faculty member has more flexibility and can do more personalized things, and um, you know, if you have more students completing, you have more of them completing with a C or better, then um, you keep students in longer, they hit their credit milestones, they hit them faster, so the university unlocks the funding from the government faster, where you might have 5,000 students, but if every year 20% of them drop and you add new students, you never get the funding because the student never hits the milestone, right? So being able to use OER in a way that is reducing costs for the institution because the library is not paying for it and is empowering the faculty member to be more, uh, taking more direct control over what's taught and what order and what kinds of examples are used. Um, I mean, we've seen in our context that more students finish, more of them finish with a good grade, they, and they take more credits, which would get you to unlocking your funding more quickly than you might be able to otherwise. Right? I, I think the one that works the best is an incremental one. Uh, it starts with the uh, uh, institution leadership, maybe the academic vice president or maybe the dean of a college who says, this is important to me, I want to help make this happen and doesn't force anything, but lets the faculty know, I support this, I'm going to provide some incentives for you, and I'm going to encourage you, but I'm not, I'm not going to require you to do anything. Um, but maybe, maybe the first thing they would do is they would get somebody like me or like some of my uh, colleagues to come in and do a training with faculty to explain what is OER, why is it powerful, how can you use it, what kinds of things can you do with it that you can't do with commercial materials and just lay out kind of the broad argument for them of what we're talking about and why it's important. And then um, faculty who self-select, faculty who volunteer to participate and say, I want to try changing my course from a traditional textbook into this model. Um, then we can work with them for a longer period to support them through the process, to teach them very, very basics of educational design, of instructional design. Um, and what, where do you start if you don't have a textbook? What should I do? You know, to lead them through that process um, and support them through there. And then also uh, set up things at the beginning to gather the right kind of data so that when the course is over, you can come back and say, OK, now here's, here's what we did for a control group. Now our treatment group in terms of our research design are the kids that used open textbooks now. And now let's go ahead and run our analysis. Did our completion change? Did C or better? Did, did the grades change? Did the drop rate change? Um, and be, be ready, be planning to ask all those questions at the beginning.
There are two different approaches you can take. You can either take open content and copy and paste it directly inside your Blackboard or your Moodle or whatever. Um, we've developed an open source platform where, um, where we curate content that uses a standard called LTI to project the content inside the learning management system. The to the student, it looks like the content is inside there, but you don't have to cut and paste anything. It kind of uses some technical wizardry to make it appear in there using LTI. But the complementarity there is if, you've got, if you haven't done online before and you're getting ready to go online for the first time, your faculty, aren't, they've never taught online because you're moving online for the first time. And that transition gives you an opportunity to say, hey, while you're going online, online is different. Maybe let's think about some different practices instead of a print textbook. Maybe we should use digital materials with your students. And if you're going to use digital, then maybe we might as well use open as long as we're here. And let me tell you what that means. The, so my, um, when I was a tenured faculty member, what I often taught was instructional design. And no PhD in physics will believe you if you tell him that he doesn't know how to teach physics because he has a PhD in physics. But he's never taken an education class, never had any training in pedagogy, but he has a PhD in physics. So you can't walk into him and say, let me help you teach better. But when his teaching is going online, online is something he doesn't understand. So now there's a sneaky opportunity for you to put a little instructional design in there to say, as, as you're moving online, well, you don't know how to do that? Let me help you. And then to build some best practices into that process of getting them online. And I would say one of those best practices should be moving, flipping them off of proprietary content onto open content when they're making the transition to the online. It really depends on the commitment of the faculty because they won't notice it. They'll think, oh, online is a big change. Part of the change is moving from proprietary to open content. Um, but they're, they, just, they know there's a big change coming, so they're ready for it. Without something as big as moving from face-to-face -to, -face to online, it might be harder to, to get them to make a big change. Start with a webinar with some of the university leadership. And if you have a couple of faculty who are always trying innovative things that are generally excited by technology-mediated learning or things like that, you know, get six or ten of us on a webinar and talk through it and see kind of how the fit is. And if, uh, if the decision is made to do something more, then we would do a two or three day on-campus visit where we'd train with faculty and work with them and teach about open licensing and staying legal, not breaking copyright law and um, all those kinds of things. And, and it would just kind of go from there. We started working on it in January and we launched it in August. So in, in eight months, we went from nothing to having 16 classes ready and offered the other classes, or maybe 14 classes ready, and then offered the rest of them in the winter term. Um, but once they decided, like the faculty got excited about it and they wanted to do it, and we came into the training, started working together, and everybody was really you know, energized, and so it went very quickly. I mean, I think as far as higher education goes, to be able to flip a whole program in under a year is really, really fast. Um, so it, it all depends on the level of interest from the faculty and commitment. The faculty are the ones who drive it. You, know, we can, you can support them financially, I can support them with know-how and with tools, but at the end of the day we wait, we're waiting for faculty to actually do the work. So if they're really gung-ho, then it can move very fast, and if they're not really interested, it can be very slow. So some of the hurdles are, um, even though the administration, the, the leadership is supportive of this move, if your individual faculty have academic freedom and can choose to do it or not do it, even if the leadership is really excited, the faculty might just say, no, no thank you. And you might have to create some pretty powerful incentives to get them to volunteer to come, because the day that you try to enforce it, you break, you, you can't really make faculty do anything. Um, Another thing is there's much more open content available in the kind of general courses, the introductory courses, than there is like at the graduate school level or maybe for senior level, you know, fourth year classes. So depending on, um, depending on the content area that a faculty member is working in, there might be more open content or less open content. Um, there might be more or less open assessments that are available too. So to, um, I would say that the biggest potential hurdles, you might have a faculty member who's really excited, and then you look back over the last three or four or five years, and there's been very, maybe there's been very little work done in that area. Um, 
So like there's a course on ethnomusicology. I don't know that there's any open materials available on ethnomusicology, right? But if it's intro introductory biology or psychology or algebra or calculus or you know those kind of very common subjects, there's lots of open content available for. Um, it, once you start to get into some more specialized uh, areas, depending on the area, sometimes there's there's less content.